Hey guys, I'm here in Guelph, Ontario at Gold Farm Canada, and we're about to do a tour of his facility. There's lots of really cool stuff here. I'm excited to show you guys what he has growing on. Hey Jacob, thanks for having me at the farm. This is really cool to be here and uh, yeah, it's great to see how much growth you've had over the last few years. So maybe for those that haven't seen the podcast, maybe you want to just give a quick background on yourself and about your farm. Yeah, Jonah, thank you for coming to uh, Gold Farm. Um, we actually just moved into this space over the past few months. Uh, we took over the lease in May, but uh, it wasn't until about September that we were finally able to start planting in here. So it was a really long process. There was a lot of work that needed to be done to the space to get it to where it is. But um, yeah, build, building out the system. Uh, so just kind of like iterations that we've gone through over time. I first started the business in my kitchen with, you know, the typical chrome, one chrome wire rack yeah. in a one bedroom apartment in Toronto. That was April 2019. Um, uh, my partner and I decided to move to Guelph um, basically just before the pandemic. And I had actually given my notice to my previous employer, like my last day of work was the weekend of lockdown in oh, March, wow. 2020. So yeah, yeah. it really kicked me in the butt and like forced me to kind of make a decision to go into this wholeheartedly. So we were renting a three bedroom apartment here in Guelph. So I converted one whole room. I had went from one rack to six racks. And then um, in the fall of 2020, uh, we rented our first commercial space, which was less than 450 square feet. Uh, this space that you're looking at here is over 2,000 square feet. Um, and so uh, capacity-wise, because I know a lot of microgreen growers kind of measure the, their scale in terms of the capacity in terms of number of trays. Uh, so we went from 20 trays in the first iteration to 120 trays to 300 trays. And now we can do almost 2,000 trays. Wow. Yeah, it, lo it looks great. The setup looks super, super clean. It's nice when everything's new and clean too. <laughs> when you just move in a new facility, it's yeah. like, it just looks like magic. And you know, it'll, it'll stay relatively clean because you got you got a good setup here. So um, yeah, so it'd be great to kind of go through the process of how you grow, what, what technology you're using, what equipment you're using, and kind of uh, go through the process of uh, average week in the life of a farmer at Gold Farm. Sure, sure. So, uh, I mean, one of the first, uh, one of the nice things about being in a bigger space is that we're now able to have some fun new toys that we just didn't have the space for before. So, um, really, everything starts with the soil, which, uh, so we, right now, we're using ProMix BX, um, which is just a ready-made mix from one of the larger Canadian producers. Uh, and then we were able to buy this uh, machine from SB Machinery in Quebec. Uh, this is the SB05, and it's a bale breaker and flat filler. So um, the bales of soil get uh, dumped into this end of the mixer and then broken up. And uh, through the grate, the white grating, uh, we can add our fertilizer. Oh, um, nice. We use, uh, we use a Gaia Green uh, all-purpose, which is a uh, 444 granulated fertilizer. Um, and we mix that in with the soil just to give all the crops kind of a little boost um, right off the hop. And so um, on the front end of, uh, of the bale breaker, we, we can add this, um, uh, this conveyor belt. And essentially, there's a treadle on the machine, so it's foot operated. Uh, as it's running, the treadle opens the door, and we can just Push fill our flats, there. put them through. Uh, this roller compacts the soil as it moves through. So it kind of, um, we've gone from um, having to basically fill our flats completely manually, like scoop by scoop, yeah. to being able to prep all of our flats at once uh, for the whole week, basically. Yeah. Excuse me. Um, which is which obviously saves a ton of time. So that this has been kind of a game changer for us. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, go ahead. I actually, I actually, we actually used to have this way back when, and uh, going from no soil mixing machinery to that is like a complete game changer. Like yeah. the, doing it by hand, it, it, it's it's tiring. You know, it it can be quite burdensome yeah. over a long period of time. 
Um, and you know, just it, it, there, there's there's so many options. But the, the from my experience, SP is pretty pretty reliable, pretty good quality. Yeah. And um, and and the nice thing is this one's compact. It's yeah, it is small. very small it's and it's wheel it, wheel around. It's easy to move around. The funny thing was that I uh, I had to buy it through a company in the states. Oh, interesting. even though the manufacturer is in Canada, like huh. that is their distributor, I guess. Interesting. Uh, Ball Seed was who I had to buy it from. Oh. Um, because that's who represents them on the market, I guess. Huh. It very, it, I thought it was very interesting that I couldn't just buy a machine from them directly, yeah. even though they manufactured this one specifically for us. Like it wasn't ready to go or anything. So, yeah, it's um, kind of funny. It's the same thing with the uh, the active aqua trays. Yeah, these guys they're made in Quebec, but you have to buy them through Hydro Farm, and they get shipped from the U.S., which is <laughs> it's one of one of those like globalism things that you're just like, does this really make sense? But it's it is what it is. Yeah. As long as you can get them, which is nice, and uh, the supply chain issues are kind of seem to be over, at least from what I've seen. Yep. Have you noticed any supply chain issues at hand recently? No, I haven't had any issues since post pandemic. Like yeah. everything's been kind of back to normal. Nice. Like some things that we use are just uh, the suppliers that we buy them from. Uh, they aren't necessarily like standard items; they're special order. But as long as I give them a little bit of lead time, then yeah. they get them in hand, and it's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah. So I guess so from there. Yeah, from there. Um, I'll I'll walk you down. So this is our work area, um, where we have all of our kind of like hand tools and stuff like that. Oh, nice! Everything's on wheels. Everything everything is on. Yeah. Now that we're in a bigger space, yeah, it really uh, is good. So. When we're seeding, when we're harvesting or whatever, this is kind of the work area. Um, I can have uh, on harvest day, I know I'm jumping ahead, but on harvest day, we usually have four people here. Um, oh, nice. uh, yeah, the rest of the time, it's just myself and one full-time person. Yeah. Um, but that way we have lots of work area. Uh, so basically the, the trays just get, the once the trays are filled with soil, they all just get laid out on the tables. We can do almost, 30 trays at a time basically oh, with nice. these four tables in terms of seed how much we can seed yeah um uh obviously some seeds are soaked some seeds aren't um everything for the most part is weighed out uh we use these um jewelry scales uh to weigh seeds like fairly precisely yeah uh we have a whole rubric that i've created over time just experimenting with different seeding densities so everything gets hand seeded um we do uh, germinate some stuff and it goes into germination. Some stuff goes under domes. Um, and then the rest goes in here in our germination tent. Oh, um, nice. So we got a much bigger germination tent. Nice. Um, then last time everything okay, is cool. stacked and weighted. And yeah. Awesome. Do you find this like how humid does it get in there? Well, it looks like it's 45 now. Yeah, right now, well, the, the door has been open for oh, a little okay. bit and yeah, I actually yeah. had to put a little space heater in there. Uh, oh, interesting. Because I was noticing that it wasn't significantly warmer yeah, or, or anything. Yeah. So I actually put in the space heater. The space heater was driving the humidity down. So now I put water, like pans of water yeah. in there basically to to bring the humidity back up. But yeah, like ideally in there we're at above 26 degrees temperature and above 50% humidity uh, just to kind of promote that like fast germination. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then once uh, everything is germinated, it all comes out under lights. We have two different um, lighting schedules uh, based on kind of different varieties and what they uh, what they prefer in like for photo period. On our harvest days on Thursdays, we deliver uh, ninety five percent of my clients are in Toronto. We're here in Guelph, uh, so delivery day is Fridays, and that way restaurants like when they're busy on the weekend, they've got fresh product in their hand that day. Yeah. So that's kind of why we've structured it that way. Um, but yeah, Thursday, uh, everything is harvested by hand. So, um, we do some stuff like nasturtium and red bait sorrel that's actually hand picked and counted leaf by leaf. And then other stuff is just cut. We use, uh, for the most part, we use these, uh, Mercer, uh, culinary, uh, knives. Oh, interesting. I found these the best. They're, they're not serrated. No, they're not. It works better. I've never used a serrated knife. Okay. I've just used these. I, I, at first, I was using like um, like a uh, field knife for lettuce, yeah, like yeah. the orange handle yeah. with the kind of curved blade. Uh, but these, I I found them, it must have been on another grower's channel or something like that. They talked about these. 
And since I've gotten these, I've just found no reason to switch. Yeah. They're deadly sharp right out of the box nice. and they stay relatively sharp, relatively long. And then when I need to, I just use one of these sharpeners and I, I've maybe tossed one in like three or four years. I've tossed one knife because it got kind of chipped. Yeah. But yeah, they last a long time and they're just like, yeah, they're very, very sharp. It's kind of funny. I just uh, did some filming on some uh, microgreens I grew at home and I, I have like these like old miracle plate knives. You remember those commercials? Sure. So I still, <laughs> I still have those knives. Those are the knives I just, I just use. And I always say I'm growing at home just for personal use. So I don't have a harvester anymore. So I've been, um, uh, I tried cutting with them and it was amazing how dull they were. So the commercial <laughs> definitely didn't hold up for like, 15 years after I bought them, but I just got a, a sharpener to sharpen them. Cause I was like, wow, I'm so used to, I uh, was so used to harvesting with a harvester yeah. that when I switched to the blade, I'm like, it's really important to have like a razor sharp blade. Otherwise you're spending a lot of time picking out the roots that get pulled up and all that extra process that you kind of have to go through when you don't have a sharp knife. Yeah. So uh, further to that, I mean, like, I don't know if you've interviewed, uh, Chris Thoreau or if you've talked to no. him a lot, uh, Again, one of those kind of mentors for me in, in the in the microgreen space, especially here in Canada. Uh, he did Vancouver micro urban micros for yeah. a long time. He's, he's mostly doing research now, but I remember him doing videos comparing like scissors to knives yeah. and different kinds of knives. And um, basically, just to boil it down, like what I what he uh, explained really clearly is that when you're using a scissors, for example, that like. I would not recommend scissors because scissors actually like chew the stems. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you're going to get a more raggedy stem. It's not going to look as good. And it's actually going to start uh, breaking the microgreen down, the seedling down faster. Yeah. So a super, super sharp knife gives you a nice clean cut. It looks better, but it also is actually going to make your greens last longer. Yeah, no, I've noticed that as well. Especially things like sunflower, they won't yellow at the, at the tip. Yeah. Um, so that that's kind of what I've just noticed is that like it, it extends the shelf life yep. when you have a really sharp knife. It is a little bit dangerous. So you always want to cut away, which is something that's like a habit that's hard to kind of form sometimes. But yeah, you really want to cut away, not cut towards you. Because like a, it could, yeah. I've gotten some pretty bad cuts in the, in the past, but maybe that's just me. It's a technique. It's just learning over time for sure. Yeah. Um, but as well, um, you know, when you first recommended the greens harvester and I got that, one of the first things I bought alongside it is Kevlar gloves yeah, yeah. and generally you're fine. Like you yeah. have to really hack yourself to, <laughs> to, to cause a problem at that, at that point. But, uh, um, you can always just have your, your people wear gloves yeah. if you're, if you're worried about it, but, um, there's no, there's no wood at hand to knock on, but, uh, we haven't had any like major cuts or anything like yeah. that during harvest. So it's yeah. Good. Cool. So in terms of, um, your grow space. I see you have some, it looks like you have some automation starting to come into play. Yep. Um, but you're still in the proto, like not prototyping phase, but you're still working out the kinks in the system. So for yeah. now you're still mostly watering by hand, but it looks like you have it set up here yeah. to completely automate the watering process, which I know there's a lot of farms that are, are interested in that because of how, um, how much time it takes to water. So, yeah. What's kind of your time frame to, to get that fully switched out to, to the automated watering? I mean, I, I want that to be in place as soon as possible because that kind of gives us more freedom. Um, not that watering is the most labor intensive task, but it, it is quite a lot of labor. Um, so if I can free up those hours, it's just, we can focus on other things. Yeah. Um, but it's also just more personal freedom as well to be able to give myself, my staff person, like, vacation days and stuff like that. Like, um, my, I have one full-time employee and she works Monday to Friday, which means I have to come in on Saturdays and Sundays and water. Yeah. Um, yeah. so I would like to not have to do that. Uh, I would not be surprised if this whole process is going to take us a year to, to really get to that point where everything is, is handed over. Um, that's just what I'm preparing for. Yeah. Yeah. I think also keep in mind that you're also doing a lot of other expansion. Like I remember you mentioned that uh, these uh, active <laughs> air fans are causing you some trouble because they move so much air because they're so efficient yeah. compared to the, the, some of the other ones that, that there's, and I've noticed the same thing when, when I moved, when we expanded 
um, Living Earth in 2019. We had dry spots on the farm. We had to figure out it was near a shipping door. There's like every time you move a facility, you think, oh, Micron's going to grow the same no matter where you are. But it's really different depending on where you are. The environment will be different. Just having a fan in a few inches off can sometimes make a difference. Yeah. So there's so many factors at play here. It sounds like you're you're doing some testing on soil as well. So there's a lot of uh, R and D kind of going on at the same time, which can kind of play at uh, the speed of of like trying to get everything in line at the same time. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, as long as stuff is happy, then yeah, you know, there's not as much impetus to to uh, make wholesale changes so quickly. With the fans, I just find that they're too powerful. Like we don't need to move quite so much yeah, air. Yeah. I, obviously, like ventilation and circulation is super important, but uh, not to the point of like desiccating yeah. your crops. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like we, so like I said, like we, we took the lease in May. Actual construction work didn't even start until the end of May. We didn't start growing here until September. I had to be out of my old space at the end of September. Yeah. So I thought that five months would be enough runway to get everything built and ready to go. And essentially, we were like down to the wire, had to move everything, didn't have time to grow test crops here, didn't have time to really like do that R&D yeah. before yeah. we moved in. So now we're having to do it like real we're time. having to problem solve in real time and yeah. like fix issues with crops that we didn't necessarily have before. Like, like you say, just different environment different airflow, different yeah. humidity, different temperature. There's so many different variables. So we're kind of having to just hit the ground running and, and, you know, triage those things as we go. Yeah. But that's kind of the fun. There's like a lot yeah. of fun in, in that problem solving as well. Um, so, but one mistake we made that I am perfectly fine in sharing, like I think everybody makes mistakes and you learn from them yeah. is we just, if you look at it in a more scientific lens, we threw in way too many variables all at once. New grow, let a, like yes, new space, like that's a major one. But also new lights, bale breaking machine. We were trying a different soil medium. Yeah, like just so many factors all at the same time, and so it was actually hard at first to even diagnose the problems because we couldn't. It, it wasn't so easy to just take one factor out. We yeah. didn't know what factor it could be. So it's it's been a process, but like I say, it's kind of part of the fun yeah. as well. I, I think also, like, I think five, like if you asked me, obviously given that Living Earth sold, we haven't been able to really keep in touch since that, that process, but uh, from a consulting perspective. But if you came to me, I would have said five months should have been plenty, you know? But because of all the aftermath from COVID, not because COVID's been gone for a while but there's just the aftermath of labor shortages and things like that it's it's just things take longer now and it's how can you predict for that like five months is a long period of time to be able yeah. to transition so if you had if it was a more normal environment let's say a year from now hopefully things are like labor wise with with uh, uh trades and stuff are more back to normal that should have been plenty of time you could have done your one variable testing at a time and it, and it would have made some of that process a little smoother but Again, like hindsight's twenty twenty, and there's no way to really know that. Yeah, that's guess. that's a that's a big topic to get into, but I wouldn't even necessarily say it had anything to do with like post COVID because my contractor was incredible. He okay. was totally on top of things. Like he would great communication. I kept throwing new projects at him and other stuff that needed to get done, and he would just like take it on and take it on. I think it was more what held us up is. Even though I had a fairly good idea of what the system was going to look like, like this looks like exactly how I imagined it before I started building it. Yeah. Um, but I was unfamiliar. I have never, I've never put together any plumbing. So like, yeah, yeah. like, so you, you, did all, you did all yourself, myself and Mostly. one friend okay, built this yeah. entire system wow just the two of us that's crazy a lot of it by myself but he like he was invaluable but essentially two people over that span of time assembled all the racking glued all the pipes yeah like i hand crimped every single crimp ring on all of this pex like hundreds and hundreds of crimps so now you're my hands were like claws by the end of it but like 
I just didn't know what I was getting yeah, into. I've yeah. never worked with these materials. Yeah. And, and I just had to kind of like bite the bullet and say like, I'm in it now. So I need to learn these things at least enough to, to get it all done. Yeah. So I think, could there have been a little bit more planning beforehand or just like a little bit more understanding of what I was biting off? Possibly. But I also was very willing to pay a consultant to help me design the plumbing, help me design the lighting plan. Like, I think if you're really going to do it by yourself, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot. Like you need support yeah. of people that have done this before, um, to whatever degree you feel is appropriate. But, um, and then the other part of what took us way longer than we thought was unfortunately issues with the municipality and like, zo like not zoning, but cause I did have to go through a zoning amendment, but, um, I, I had done that before so that I was comfortable yeah. with, but like all of, we had to get a building permit. And so oh, okay. because we yeah. had, so we have a mezzanine yeah. uh, here and the existing mezzanine wasn't built to code. So oh, we no. could have left it in, but my concern was they were going to come and look yeah. at the system. We had to put an exhaust, uh, an inline fan, uh, a ventilation fan at the back of the space. Oh, we'd, okay. ha we'd have to go behind yeah. the uh, system here. We'll just um, take a quick look. So this was a major, this was one of the pro projects from the beginning was putting in a, a exhaust oh, fan. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah, it's like a greenhouse uh, kind of yeah. exhaust fan, yeah, yeah. So to, to put in something like that, like to knock a hole in the block wall, we were gonna have to call the city and, yeah, and have a building yeah. inspection. So my concern was if we left, uh, if we were going to leave the existing mezzanine that wasn't to code in place, we were going to get held up anyway because they were going to come in and say, well, now you're going to have to redo all of this. Yeah, yeah. So that added a ton. And then when we finally had our inspection, so that added, I had to get an architect. I had to get an engineer. Oh, wow. I had to okay. get an engineer to design the, like to make sure the ventilation was to code. There were just a lot of hoops. And this municipality, unfortunately, has even more rigorous requirements than a lot. Huh. So like, we got to this point, I thought I was done. And then when we came in for our final inspection, they added a bunch more things that we now have to do. Yeah. Like I have to now put in a, a double check valve, like a, a backflow preventer, even though the building has a backflow preventer, they're telling me my individual unit needs a backflow preventer. Yeah. So it's just more hoops. And it's, I understand it's like, I, I have to do what yeah. the city says regardless. Yeah. Uh, but that is, that kind of stuff is more what added yeah. Uh, to the overall, you know, like scope and why it took so long to get everything done. Yeah, I, I think it's helpful to to share that because um, that those are things that you don't like. You most people think of the actual growing setup, but they're not thinking of like the regulations and and all the other uh, legal hoops and and all that sort of stuff. Getting con contractors in and of itself is it, it can be challenging. You know, I've worked with with quite a few farms that are in that process now, and it's like. They say it'll be six weeks, but you know it's like it's never going to be that. So if if you know that going in, it's a lot easier to plan. But then there's all these other things that sometimes are uh, unforeseen. So I think sharing that's just helpful for people that are getting to this point to know that sometimes depending on where you're located and what the rules and all that stuff are, there can be more work involved than what it may appear at first. Yeah. Uh, but once it's done, it's a one-time thing. So it's not like yeah. it's something you have to do every year or something like that, you know, unless you, unless you get gap certified or, yeah. or certified organic, these type of things, you, you, you modify the structure of the building, it's done once and then you're good until yeah. you run out of space, which I think you'll be here for a while would be my guess. <laughs> we should is, be here for a while. Yeah. 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 Uh, but, uh, but who knows? Like, it'd be nice yeah, if, to, you, if you grow fast, it'd enough, be nice yeah. to grow fast enough. This used to be t uh, one big unit. Okay. So these, these two units were, uh, partitioned. So who knows? Yeah. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we should be here for a while and then yeah, there, there really aren't a lot of, you're right, it's a one and done kind of situation with the city for the most part. We may have some inspections or something yeah. that happen annually, but that's no big deal. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah, it's it's not, it's not, it, it's just getting, getting through it. And I think the one thing that the city maybe could do a little bit better is just being more upfront with all the stuff that they require yeah. and not kind of tacking it on to the end when I feel like I'm done, especially just from a budget perspective. Yeah. Like yeah. I budgeted X amount and I went over that. I knew I would go over it, but I didn't know I would go over it by like 25%. Yeah. Um, you know, which is really significant when you're talking about, you know, this, this kind of scale. So, yeah. Um, I think what, what I've noticed with, uh, 
like you know obviously the regulations are there for a reason you know they don't want like polluted water going in the waterways and all that kind of stuff yeah. so i totally get it but it, it's kind of it, it seems it's on the onus of the business owner to figure out these things rather than having like some sort of guide that's from the government that would be like hey this is the things you'll need given what you're doing i think that would be a well a good use of taxpayer money because it's like you could pay so much money just trying to figure out what you actually need and how much time you're going to spend doing that i think is it can, can be can be burdensome for 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 businesses and especially farms and this type of situation yeah. so it would be helpful if there was some sort of more clear guidance or someone that that's their role in 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 the city or or municipality that you're in 100 percent, i have totally felt that way i think there's also a potential business opportunity for like yeah. people like yourself consultants to actually consult with municipalities like the more of because i think a big part of the issue and the reason why stuff gets tacked stuff got tacked on is because all of these professionals that i've worked with whether they were the architects the engineers the inspectors they've never seen a facility like this before yeah, there yeah. are no precedents yeah so so they don't even know what what needs to happen until they're already in it and looking at it yeah you know so um you know private consultants that are working with municipalities would be great like i would almost say it's it's better for the private sector for that to come from the private sector than for there to be a city employee like you can have a yeah. person who specializes in indoor vertical farming whatever um that consults with municipalities and makes them aware of uh, uh of issues yeah. that face you know new farms that want because a lot of cities are keen to you know add these types of businesses and are happy to have them in their municipalities but they don't really know how to deal with them so, yeah yeah, yeah. And I, th I think the challenge from like i'm thinking of the the challenge on the other side is like there's not enough vertical farms yet for that to be like you can do like just general biz like building uh, uh preparation or, or or things like that yeah but specific to vertical farming i think would be a bit tougher because it's so like vertical farms in itself are pretty niche but then vertical farms um consulting for the the permits and all that kind of stuff it's it, it's different every single city sure. so it would be a little more difficult from that sense but i hope the industry will get big enough that that will be an actual Always, thing yeah. okay cool so i'd love to hear kind of your experience with the lighting here yep. um what you kind of started with what you're using now have you seen any differences between different lights you've tested over the years you've been growing? Yeah, so, I mean, the first lights I used were lights that vast majority of microgreen growers use, Barinas uh, from Amazon. They're cheap as chips and they work really well. Um, but over the years we have kind of moved. Um, what, one thing, again, kind of touching back on, you know, like regulatory issues and making sure we're uh, in compliance is like the lights have to be wet location uh, a lot of people don't think about that, especially home growers or like people that are transitioning into a commercial space. Yeah. Uh, in order to have the ESA, the Electrical Safety Authority, sign off, which you need to do if you're working with a building permit and doing major electrical work. Um, the only way they'll get to sign, they'll sign off on this type of setup is if they're wet location. It's the same kind of thing as like uh, IP rating on your cell yeah. phone. It's ingress protection. It just means that the lights aren't going to short out from being having like water uh, being near water. So, um, so that kind of limits you already in terms of what fixtures you can even look at. Uh, but obviously there are a ridiculous yeah. amount of lights on yeah. the market that do meet that uh, requirement. I was getting super overwhelmed when I was researching lights. We, we, the lights we used before, I think I needed maybe 140 some odd for the last space to grow about 300 trays. That was maybe a little low. I, I should have gotten a few more, but you know, less than 200 light fixtures. Um, so I just went with what was easy at hand. I bought them from Hydro Farm, which is a distributor here in Ontario, and they were, I think, their own like Photo Bio was the name of the uh, the brand name. And then these are from another are from I, I settled on these fixtures. Um, they're from a Canadian uh, company called Futurevert in Quebec. And I went with them because they're very, very similar to the ones that we used before. So there wasn't going to be like a steep learning curve. Yeah. Um, I started going down the rabbit hole of like red LEDs and blue LEDs and, you know, all of the different permutations and just ended up like going with 
these kind of more generic germination or like vegetative germination lights because yeah. For the length of time that microgreens are under the lights, you you can get you can get more you know uh, picky with the lights, and we may kind of look at that over time. But in really the only difference, that, so the last lights that we used were more of that like blurple kind okay. of uh, look anyway, so more red and blue LEDs. Um, the only major difference I've noticed is just with those crops that do have more color, like purple basil red mizuna stuff like that the colors are just a little bit more muted i i haven't done like an extensive flavor comparison to to see um so that would be really interesting but um yeah but I'll, that's i'll be doing that all on my channel so cool yeah yeah so people can uh, stay tuned for that yeah i'll just i'll just you know watch keep, it yeah <laughs> <laughs> keep keep an eye out for that but yeah that's the only major difference that i noticed um, these are all, I think they're like 27 watt fixtures. The ones that we used before were like 30 watt fixtures. I just made sure I actually got the company to do like a lighting design for me because I wanted to achieve a certain like par rating. Yeah. So that was more my approach here, which was definitely more informed than the last iteration. Yeah. Um, I, I needed, I, I wanted to get that kind of like more even distribution of light across the whole surface of the flood table. So um, that's why we went with, uh, we're doing like 10 fixtures per level. So again, another big consideration when we bought the lights is like just the cost. Yeah. Because you can spend 10 bucks a fixture and you can spend a thousand dollars a fixture uh, and, you know, everything in between. And when you're buying over a thousand fixtures, that's a huge part of the ex expense of uh, scaling up a farm. So um that was a major factor. And then just, I settled on a Canadian company because I didn't have to pay to import them. I didn't have to pay as much shipping costs. Like it was just, the cost was way less for a comparable light yeah. than something that might've been a 10th better or better in one aspect. This was just, it kind of met all of those requirements. And if I have any issues, if I need to get stuff replaced, it's way easier. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, that, that's one of the challenges we had early on with using like LEDs were new when I bought them in 2014. And the really the power supplies were the biggest issue. They just kept burning out. They got better each year we bought them. But each year that passes, the LEDs are getting more efficient. So while I'm doing testing on this, but in, in theory, the, the blurple lights should be more efficient, like you'll get more output. Yep. Um, but there are some advantages to the white lights. Um, one is you can see issues a lot e more easily. Yeah. Um, and I find it's more pleasant to work it. Like after, you know, I'm growing with both the blurple and the white lights yeah. and it's just like, I'm doing time lapses and stuff. And I'm so used to having the purple lights from being at living earth. And it's like, it's really pleasant to be around the white lights <laughs> after yeah. being around blurple lights for so long. Yeah. But having said that, like, I'm going to do more testing. So this is not for sure, but my understanding is that it is more efficient from a growth perspective. But again, like, you know, at a certain point, like it's, uh, you know, uh, paralysis by analysis. There's so many options now for LEDs that at some point you got to just pick and they're all, they're all going to be better than fluorescent or like, you know, what, what used to be available. So you're going to be moving in the right direction no matter which way you go. And it really comes down to how much, uh, how much light you need per level. And that's where having a company like uh, the company you're working with will, will design the system for you to get the right amount of par. Yeah. And that's one thing I had to kind of do on my own which, you know, I actually enjoyed, but if I wasn't a time crunch, it's something that takes time to figure out. So yeah. if you just have someone do it for you, there's a lot of value in that. It's the same kind of value as a consultant, right? They're going to have the information yeah. at hand. You don't have to spend the time. You can spend time growing your business, doing sales or whatever it is you want to do and spend less of time trying to figure out these things that have already been figured out by someone else. That's exactly it. It's just knowing like when it's way easier to just reach out to somebody that has the knowledge yeah. rather than trying to gain the knowledge yourself. That's also just being aware of yourself and your interests as well. Yeah. Like I, I honestly don't, I don't know that I have the interest enough to like deep dive into LEDs and, and that that's just not where my interest lies in the business. So I'd rather just go to a company that like they've already done the yeah. research. Um, so yeah, that's, that's kind of what we settled on where, when it comes to lights. But again, like I'm also always trying to keep my ear to the ground and uh, we, have a couple of different potential companies that we may work with to do like lighting trials. Oh, cool. Um, 
where they'll kind of like send us fixtures that they're prototyping for free to just kind of like test. Oh, nice. Um, now, this may be like a grant project that we do where it's much more like rigorous and, and regimented. But, uh, but that's the plan is to eventually like uh, test out some of these more uh, high tech fixtures where the uh, they're dimmable, they're like wavelength tunable, stuff like that. So um, I didn't want to, I could have bought higher powered lights and dim them, but I just didn't feel like attenuating a light made as much sense as just buying a light that I could use at full, yeah. at full strength. Um, also you need more electrical exactly like to handle otherwise yeah. like what's the point of getting them you know yeah so yeah, there, there's extra costs associated with having that flexibility which may depending on the type of farm you have may be a benefit but if you're trying to be a production farm it's probably better to go kind of the route you did which is getting what you actually need instead of beyond what you need yeah and i mean eventually what i might do is just i still have all the fixtures that we were using at the old farm so i may just replace some of these on a few levels where we do grow those uh purple. those crops that have the purple in them yeah. just to kind of like push the color a little bit more yeah it'd be it should be pretty easy i think they're essentially the same connections and everything so okay, nice. it'll be pretty easy to swap them up and they're just zip tied so it's yeah pretty easy to swap them out yeah so how many how many levels Growing levels do you have here? Total levels 108. Oh, wow. Okay. Uh, and each one holds 16 trays. So, yeah. yeah. The, this system, uh, like the, the pallet racking, can hold 1,728 trays. Wow. And then we have a few rolling racks that we can use if we need to. For, yeah. For, like, oh, that's smart. Yeah. yeah for extra. Yeah. For saw, extra saw... or for more sensitive things yeah. or whatever. Like, we grow all our red vein sorrel under our old original Barina lights that are like four years old and still yeah. working perfectly. Yeah. Uh, just because I find that they grow better under like l less intense lights. Oh, interesting. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Also, uh, I wanted to ask you about um, uh, the edible flowers. So right now, given the winter months, you're, you're, it, it, you said that you're not really growing them right now, but are you planning to still grow them coming into the spring, summer next year? Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah. Like uh, it's, it's, a kind of central like core part of our business model now is is the edible flowers yeah but yeah we i wish we lived in a yeah, in yeah. an area I where i could have them year round uh we may get to that point in this space where we can have some year round yeah uh, i never really want to bring plants in at the end of a growing season so i actually tried that this year and what i found was um the the shelf life of the flowers even though the plants were still producing flowers the flowers were dying a lot more quickly like i was getting feedback from my clients that the flowers were dying much more quickly so oh. and i'm like we live and die by the quality of yeah. our products so yeah. i'm not going to sell a subpar product just to like push it out there yeah so we have been relegated because of the you know the zone that we live in we really can only grow flowers like they're truly productive between June and say October, yeah. um, which is great because in those months, it's a huge boost to our sales um, because they are such a premium product and we can charge a premium for them. Yeah. But it's also very labor intensive. Uh, they have to be hand picked. Uh, you know, they require a lot of fertilizing and hand watering and, and yeah. all that. Um, so it's a lot, but the longer term plan is to over winter like is to grow plants indoor grow flowers indoors all year round yeah it's just uh one of those areas where we need more like i just need to talk to more growers that are already doing that type of thing yeah because it's so particular and i i honestly am just not that good at starting some flower seeds from uh, some flower plants from seed uh i just I often will buy starts when we do our flowers outdoors. It, it's just, obviously way yeah. quicker to get yeah. them going, but also like I just, uh, for however many times I've tried to start pansies and violas from seed, yeah. I, I have a very hard time getting them to grow well. Yeah. But like we've got, I've got some, like uh, I'm trying to get some borage and some uh, marigolds going. Uh, borage, marigold and violas are really the ones that I would like to. And I think, of those, actually, the marigolds and the and the violas are the most viable for indoor production because they're really low they're profile. Really short, yeah, yeah. I don't. Yeah. I can grow them. I could grow them on these 
basically if I yeah. wanted to, or, oh, or for sure. on the chrome wire racks. But and they like, look great. The the microgreens are growing in marigolds. They look super healthy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So like that that's that's fine. It's more just like um, anything else. Any other flower is just going to be too tall. Yeah. So it would require a whole different setup where I would have to get more um, like those individual you know high wattage fixtures. Yeah. Like. Yeah. That a lot of people use for like cannabis and stuff yeah. like that. Uh, but you know, you have to hang those from chains from the ceiling or whatever. Yeah. And like we, we do have the space for that. So that is kind oh, of cool. maybe a longer term plan is like to That'd convert cool. the, the kind of front room yeah. into the flower area, but it's also colder in there. So there's, yeah. there, it's going to take a while. And, and this is really the priority for me for sure. again, like we talked about before, like triaging the problems and kind of getting all the micros to be in a really happy place before we, add another for sure, layer yeah, but yeah. but that is the long-term goal i mean um it's right on the side of our delivery van we do like microgreens and edible flowers so i've fully committed to that and i think there's an absolutely massive market yeah. with our clientele because we focus completely on restaurants in the culinary industry like adding edible flowers to the microgreen offering is just a no-brainer for sure uh so um oh. we, not every chef wants to use them like it's just like not every chef wants to use microgreens, but those that do use a lot and it's just, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's very profitable in the summer months for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And the more, the more, like I've learned so much doing the podcast and interviewing farms the last couple of months. And uh, the more farmers I talk to, the more are interested in edible flowers. So even uh, I, I had a, a interview with uh, Coper Cress, one of the biggest microgreen growers in the world, probably at this yeah. point. Um, and even they, they're doing a ton of edible flowers. Um, even they still pick the edible flowers by hand. That's how difficult it is to automate. Because yeah. if they could automate it, it would be automated. Um, that I could tell you for sure. Yeah. So it, it's interesting to see how much demand. Because when I started 10 years ago, edible flowers were so niche. And one, one thing that's really cool is you guys built your own walk-in cooler. Yeah. And a lot of farms either use fridges, which I think is, is a good way to start. But it gets to a point where it's just, you don't have enough space. Yeah. Um, and obviously with the scale you're you're growing at and you're planning to grow at, you need something more scalable. So there's a couple options. One, which is to buy a walk-in cooler, and then one is to build one. So yeah. I'd love to hear why you decided to go this route, what the cost difference was, your sure. experience building it. Yeah, so I mean, definitely, you know, you can get a walk-in cooler. Uh, it's going to cost you for something this size, even ten to $20,000 easily um, with the compressor and everything. And that again, would require uh, different, would have different requirements from the municipality in terms of like uh, venting it and, and all that. So this requires no venting. Uh, it really, it, it was super easy. It's just a room within a room. So it's just studs and joists. And then um, the insulation that we used is, uh, this is um, polyisocyanurate, which is a rigid foam insulation. Um, and it's essentially five inches thick oh, of, wow. uh, of insulation. Um, but that gets us to the R rating that Coolbot. So uh, this is powered by a device called Coolbot. Uh, we have the pro version, which is Wi-Fi uh, enabled. So it's great because if there's ever any problems, I get a notification on my phone. Yeah, and I that's can, really nice. I only live about five minutes away from the farm, so I can jump over here. And it really has only happened like once right at the beginning. And otherwise, it's been steady state, which yeah. is really nice. Um, but yeah, like this cost me about a quarter of what it, that that's including the cool bot itself, which is probably about 500 bucks, a really nice window mounted air conditioner, which was probably about the same amount of money. This insulation is not cheap. Wood is not cheap. Yeah. Paying the contractor like all in probably cost me about five grand. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. Well, including labor. That's great. Everything. Yeah. 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 And, and that's just, yeah, there's no comparison to what it would have cost me. Uh, to, to buy a walk-in cooler and we were using fridges beforehand like like you see at a convenience store with yeah. the sliding glass doors and everything and they're they're great like they yeah. worked and they're fine but they needed a lot of servicing oh really either well i bought well i bought them oh, okay, used, used and they're yeah, older yeah. and you know yeah. the gaskets are going and the coolant you know they, they they have issues but um but this has been excellent since we uh started using it uh it's very cold in there uh uh and uh yeah it's just been super solid so i yeah, can show let's you take a look um, yeah and really, it's just um, we keep our seeds in here as well. Obviously, um, oh, just nice. helps okay. them helps them last yeah, off longer. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, this is the, the what runs the whole thing. So it's just a 
a window mounted air conditioner and uh, and the cool bot and it's got a sensor that's uh, reading the the room temperature it's got a sensor that is pushed into the fins of the air conditioner yeah uh, and that's what is actually like uh, detecting the temperature uh, on the unit itself and then it's actually got a heater which is like you pull the uh, the uh, sensor out of the air conditioner and tie it to a little heating unit so it's you're, really what you're doing is just overclocking yeah. the uh, the air conditioner and, and forcing it uh, to to uh, keep the air cooler. But yeah, it's, it's as work, you can it's see, it's well. like we keep it at about forty one Fahrenheit. Okay, nice. uh, like five degrees Celsius essentially. Yeah, it's super cold in here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so seeds will last longer, and all of our product uh, stays nice and fresh for nice. for delivery day. I mean, it's only in here less than twenty four hours yeah. from harvest to when we deliver it. But uh, you obviously want to make it, you know, last as long as possible. Yeah, so. for sure. And it's the perfect temperature to store seed because uh, I didn't realize that 40 is, is, is the ideal time. Like fruit freezing it, I thought was. And then after talking to High Mowing, having them on the podcast, I yeah. was like, oh, interesting. 40 degrees, 40% 40 humidity will we'll keep the seeds lasting much longer. And I, I like wouldn't have thought that. But because of freezing, you have the condensation that this temperature is actually ideal. So yep. the seeds that are in here will probably last many, many years. Oh, if, yeah. If they needed to, but I'm sure you're going to go through them. Well, we, we have seeds that are in here from several yeah. years ago that are still perfectly viable. Yeah. And, and the, you can tell the, the humidity is super low yeah, in here. Yeah, it's, like, it's very low in here. Yeah. Uh, and outside, just out the door, it's at like 50%. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, this yeah. is a super efficient system. Awesome. Yeah, yeah. I'm, glad, I'm glad you built it. I haven't, actually haven't seen this installation before. It's quite, it almost looks like you can plant little seeds in it. <laughs> you probably it, could. You kind of can't really see on the camera. But uh, yeah, it looks it looks like it's uh, the rock wool that you can plant uh, uh, sprouts in. Yeah. So this was just what was recommended by my contractor. I think. Oh, like, interesting. Okay. I, I, there's lots of different rigid foam insulation, but I think um, to keep the profile as low as possible to achieve the R rating that we yeah. wanted, this was the solution. Yeah. It, se it seemed like it, yeah. It, it seems like it's keeping temperature really well in there. Yeah. And, it's great. Uh, and you got lots of space in there, which is really nice. Over yeah. oversizing a cooler is one thing that uh, <laughs> I definitely recommend because those fr like those fridges that you, that if you buy them new, they must be almost the same price as this cooler, you know, but, no, very... but most people don't have the space, right? That's really the yeah. issue. Yeah. Two to $3,000 easily. Even used ones can creep up to like just under $2,000 wow. for yeah. like a double door fridge yeah. from restaurant supply. Or, yeah. or whatever so yeah. uh this is this was a no-brainer it's awesome. like one of the best decisions yeah ever. yeah no I'm, I'm glad you guys uh went this route yeah okay awesome it's been uh it, it's been great uh yeah. having you or it's been great being <laughs> on your being at your farm and seeing all the progress you made the last few years i think this is really really cool Thanks. Um, yeah, so thanks for having me and I'm excited to see you guys grow over the next few years and maybe next time I come back all these guys will be full in, uh, in a year or two. I hope so. Yeah. Thanks for coming, Jonah. Awesome. Thanks. 